All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've got Emily Weber with us. Uh, yeah. So we have. So welcome to Communities of Practice, the missing piece of the organization. I thought I could remember that name, but that I didn't at the, <laughs> at the 11th hour. So, okay. Thanks a lot, Emily, for joining in. And uh, over to you. Take it over. Yeah. So, hello. I'm going to talk about Communities of Practice, the missing piece of your agile organization. And I'm, I'm sad that I'm doing this from home and I'm not in India. Um, but the, situ the things are as they are. Um, I, will, I will jump in. So um, imagine, if you will, um, you've just joined a company. Um, you're very excited about it. Uh, you're quite nervous. It's a new role. It's uh, something that you really want to do, but it's, there's lots of new challenges. Um, and the company is really big. There's lots of other people in it. There's lots of kind of groups of people that you can see. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and you are, you know, again, you're feeling, how do, I, how do I find my way around? How do I work out what's going on here? And you're put in charge of a really important product. So you're leading something that's really important for the organization, which is, again, is brilliant. You think this is great, uh, something that I really want to do. And the organization say to you that you're now in charge of this really important product. Uh, don't mess it up. Putting, putting the pressure on and off you go. You think, oh, OK, so uh, there's a high expectation on me here to do a brilliant job. So you think I'm going to I've got this all this pressure on me. I'm going to look to my team and my, my team will help me. And the team say, what are we doing next? And you're thinking, ah, so this is uh, not an uncommon situation that you join a new organization or you join a new team or you are in a new role and you're feeling a bit like this. Now, sink or swim is not a good management technique. And I've seen this in lots of places. It can lead to drowning. I've seen places that think of sink or swim, you know, throw somebody into something and see what happens. Uh, as a rite of passage, but it won't get the best out of people. And there is a uh, there is a better way. We need supportive, co supportive, connected organisations in order to be our best. So namaste. Uh, my name is Emily. Um, I'm an agile and delivery consultant. I main work with, work mainly with organisations that are trying to get better at what they do in some way. And my focus, my kind of agile focus is around people, how people work together, how they connect with each other and how organizations can be better when they're connected. This is me. This is my Twitter address, my, my blog, um, if you want to look that up. Um, and I have a habit. Um, my habit is not collecting logos, which it might look like from this slide. Uh, my habit is connecting people. So on the left hand side here is a there's a bunch of organizations that I've worked with uh, around the area of communities of practice and bringing people together. Um, and I've been doing it for a while. I, I work a lot with uh, UK government organizations, helping them bring people together. Some non-government organizations, some international organizations there. Uh, Intercorp is a Peruvian uh, group of companies and GEO is somebody that probably many of you recognize, so I won't need to explain. On the right is the is things that I do that are kind of not in my consulting life um, or not in my my paid and client life. Uh, I I often set up meetups. So there's a bunch of meetups here, including um, Agile on the Bench, Agile on Leads, Agile on the Ether is a online meetup that I've been running for a couple of years, as well as setting up things like forums for the area I live in or a group for people that want to get more healthy. So I really believe that we are pow more powerful when we are connect with other people so this so this uh, comes through into my into my working life and my just outside working life as well and with these uh, many organizations that i've worked with i often ask people a question when i'm running workshops and that question is what value do you get from meeting people who do the same thing as you now i've asked this question of thousands of people um, and it's probably uh, things that might spring to your mind uh, just thinking very quickly about that question. Um, and what tends to come out is the same things. So here's a sample um, of that. So there are uh, lots of things in here, things like people, ideas, solving problems together, confidence, you know, shared concern, getting inspired, 
jokes, <laughs> um, complaining about things together. Uh, there's lots of things that come out of it. Actually, the, the answers that are in here are a mixture of designers uh, in Lima, in Peru, and uh, uh, engineers in southwest England. So aside from the fact that there's some Spanish in here, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Uh, they The answers tend to be pretty much the same. And we are that's because we are wired to connect with each other. We're wired to connect with people and we get huge value from doing that. So um, what are communities of practice? So back to back to why we're here in the first place. And uh, talking to you about communities of practice. So um, I've got a few and I've got quite a few quotes and a few photos in this session. And. Um, uh, sorry. And these are some quotes from some community members. So things like we keep each other going. Everyone is professional, insightful and emotionally supportive. Having uh, kindred spirits to bounce ideas off discuss concerns or explore new ideas with is relieving and rejuvenating and they take their better self to work after the sessions and having a real impact on confidence and capability now these are the types of things when I read these I think you know this is the type of organization I want to work in I want to work somewhere where people feel supportive and I feel like my better self because I'm connected to other people um, and you know having confidence and capability so communities of practice can do some really wonderful things you know, we are organizations are collections of people. Sometimes those people are organized into functions. And I have worked in organizations where it's like this. Uh, in particular, there was a place that I, a small organization I used to work in where um, I was a project manager and I sat with other project managers. And that was brilliant for the fact that we were always constantly sharing things with each other, sharing approaches with each other. We had difficult clients sometimes so we could consolidate console each other in the problems that we had uh, and we were really tight-knit group and we got loads from working together this is really great for that but it's not very good for working on a uh, product or a service or a project um, when actually you need lots of different people involved so our agile organizations look a little bit more like this we have teams of people with different roles with multidisciplinary teams which is fantastic when you're working on an outcome together, but um, it means that you can lose some of the value that you get from people talking, people that do the same thing, talking to each other all the time. Now, I think multidisciplinary teams are better, um, but we need to recognize that we do lose some of the connections that we had between people um, uh, if they are sitting in functions. And then we uh, sometimes put programs around those teams as well. And um, the thing is there is we start to create more and more barriers between people that do the same thing. And this can lead to silos. Um, here's my picture of silos and his siloed language. So, you know, you have silos when people start saying things like this homogenous group name are rubbish at or a terrible at. And it's like the antithesis of empathy. You start talking about people as a group rather than individuals so you might say oh finance are very slow at paying us or that team over there aren't very good at uh, doing whatever and um this makes it uh, this makes it very difficult to work together and it can sometimes pit teams against each other which isn't very good this is um actually a, a picture of a it's a social graph and it shows um from an organization that i was working with it shows how people in a particular area um, how often they ask each other for help. So this showed um, the, the circles are people. Uh, the bigger these nodes, these bigger the circles are, the more uh, people come to them for help. So they're kind of key players in, the, in this social network. Um, and the lines between them are how often people talk to each other. So you can really see just here from this bunch of people, uh, and this is it's really fascinating to map out a network like this, um, how uh, siloed people are and how knowledge doesn't travel around them. So silos of knowledge, information, expertise, learning, support, work and decision making. This isn't very good. So communities of practice are groups of people who share concern or passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. And it's a it's a term that's been around since the 90s. But with agile organisations and multidisciplinary teams, it's really uh, super relevant. Uh, right now for us. 
And they look a little bit like this. So they, they bring people together that have the same, sometimes the same role, maybe the same concern or passion, cuts across teams, cuts across programs. And uh, this line at the side is what you do day to day. So when you're on a team, there's some kind of outcome you're working towards together. How you do it is the approach to doing it, doing it in the best way possible. And that comes through the community of practice um, or community around that practice. So communities, um, a little bit like teams, except they don't have an end date, they're voluntary participation and they're non-hierarchical. And you may also have communities of interest, so people coming together around the topic they're interested in, and you may have subgroups within communities as well. So it's just, it would just be useful for me, uh, just chat in the chat, um, just if you can say, if you're in a community of practice, I'm not gonna read anything out, but useful for each of you to see as well, and also, what you know if you're in a community what you like about them if you just put that in the discussion window um, that would be great so you can see from each other um <clears throat> so i'm gonna excuse me <clears throat> i'm gonna talk to you about five benefits of communities of practice and these are the five benefits that i talk about the most um and i'm gonna give you a couple of tips like why that's important and give you some tips within that as well so first up is that communities of practice help support us and give us confidence and motivation. I think this is super, super important. And in a recent study that I carried out, I asked people to tell me what they most love about their communities. And um, about 60% about said they most love the support that they got, So, uh, which, which echoes my ex experience that the supportive, trusting relationship between members underpins the community. So without that support network, um, it's it's difficult it's harder to build the other things on top of it so that's that's really crucial um feeling supported helps build confidence it might be just that you're sharing ideas with each other or bouncing ideas off each other uh that helps you talk things through and you can think about this picture you know this woman here's crowd surfing and um, she wouldn't jump into the crowd if there was no one there to catch her uh, so having those people there to catch you is really important Conversely to that, absence of support can be taken as a sign of mass rejection. So if we don't feel supported by our organisations, it can sometimes feel like we're being rejected by them. And I've definitely been um, <clears throat> I've definitely been in situations like that. Uh, and you can you can really feel it. It feels very different. So it's it's very likely because we're wired to connect that people will be supporting each other. Um, but not everybody has that. So it might be that people are. Uh, away from each other they're distributed um actually we're you know all being distributed at the moment makes it even hard harder for this stuff to happen uh, it makes it harder to bump into people it actually increases uh silos and reduces that knowledge flow um but if you uh sometimes when people are new they're not in that support network so it we we tend to kind of find our support networks but not everyone has that so it's important to get that and I'm leaving this, this GIF on here for a long time because it's awesome. <laughs> um, this is a quote here from um, a community of practice member and also one of my favourite uh, photos that I've taken from a workshop um, about a user researcher who felt on the fringes of a community because they were distributed and really felt that having that community started to bring them in um, and started to really feel part of something, which is important. Um, and this quote here, which is from a designer, a community in a community of practice that just felt that because he had people that had his back and that um, people would support him or if he wasn't there, people would jump in and help. It was really great for his well-being, stopped him feel, feeling overwhelmed. And he actually said that the community was one of the best things about working in that organisation. So interacting regularly with each other will help to build a supportive network. The second reason is that communities of practice help us learn and grow our skills and get better at what we do together. And there are lots of different, um, you can think about learning as more structured or more unstructured. So you might have things like, you know, schemes of work, courses, pathways, formal training at one end, deliberate practice, focus on special skills in the middle and kind of really unstructured learning on the other side. Um, and communities can really help particularly with the deliberate practice and, and unstructured learning. The great thing about unstructured learning and collaborative peer learning groups is it develops other skills as well. So critical thinking, problem solving, interpersonal and communication skills. Very different from having somebody at the front of the room telling you what to do. 
um, and actually having people learning what to do together. And not every day should be match day. Um, so many of you may recognize who's in this picture. Um, and this particular team, you know, or any any cricket team or any sports team would not be as successful as they were if they didn't spend time practicing. So, um, you know, the Mumbai Indians don't have a match day every single day. Uh, and if they did, they wouldn't be, <laughs> they would be very tired and they wouldn't be as successful as um, as they are. But when we're working, we have match day every single day. Uh, we don't spend that time to learn learn the things that we need to build our skills in order to be uh, great at what we do. I love that that, that this particular slide gets all the likes. <laughs> um, so there are ways we can do that as communities as well, taking time out of our everyday to learn things. Um, this uh, this is a quote here that says, learning sessions allowing allow, allowing people to experiment and try new tools without the same concern when building code for a production environment. So trying new things out without no, with knowing that they're not gonna go into a live environment and affect thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, or millions of people, depending on where you're working, um, uh, takes, you know, has a bit of a safety net and allows us to learn skills that when we need to use them in the real world, we, we already know how to. Add to that is feedback. So feedback is super powerful on learning. Um, it helps us if we get feedback to know that something is going well. <laughs> uh, we know to carry on in that direction. If we get feedback that something hasn't gone well, we know to pivot and change what we're doing. Feedback is very important. So when you have that safe environment and you can feedback on each other's work, um, it's a it's a super fantastic way of learning. So deliberate practice and experimenting with new skills and getting feedback and safe environments will help to grow skills and capabilities. Um, so communities of practice help us share knowledge and join up related work. Uh, this helps us bust those silos. Um, there's one uh, group of people that I was talking to in a, a team of iOS developers who were saying that they spent three weeks trying to work something out. They couldn't work out uh, something that they needed to do technically. When they went and spoke to another iOS team in the same organization, they found out they had solved that problem already. There's a real like value in the fact that you, if some if you can solve problems more easily, it actually saves a lot of money. Um, so I like to think about uh, knowledge as an iceberg. So at the top we have explicit knowledge, and this is the stuff you can write down, the stuff that doesn't change very often, you know, building layouts, holiday policies, that kind of thing. And under the water, we have implicit knowledge and tacit knowledge. And this lives in people's uh, approaches. It lives in our culture. It might change too regularly to uh, write it down. Um, it might be kind of intangible to write down. And what happens is if, if we don't have the mechanisms for, for people to talk to each other, this knowledge goes out the door when people leave. And uh, this is from 2012. But on average, people move jobs every 4.4 years. Uh, and that means that, you know, the people are moving in and out. And I think it's it's more rapidly in tech, to be fair. People are moving in and out of roles and they're taking that knowledge with them. So we need those structures in place. Um, add to that, you know, things like dependencies. So this is a uh, this is a photo from a product manager's meeting. Some of them working in the same building that hadn't met each other before, before we had a community of practice. Um, and also this quote from a, from a different set of product managers just uh, being able to link up where where their work has dependencies where they hadn't been able to before, and suddenly that bringing that knowledge together is um, really uh, helpful. And add to that, we have things like um, on hand real time help and information. So having a bunch of people that you can reach out to to ask questions for on something like uh, here is MS Teams and Slack. Um, just being able to do that uh, in real time is is it just helps everyone in their role. Uh, and also this uh, this picture this is a great picture from a from a meetup that I was involved in. And this is a bunch of iOS developers sitting in an office in Mumbai. Uh, on the screen, we had um, iOS developers from the BBC in the UK, and they're actually spread out all across the country, um, sharing what they sharing approaches um, to their work um, across different continents. Um, and having this meetup was fantastic because uh, getting a view of um, how other people solve problems that you have in different organizations in different ways is is, uh, is just helps everybody. 
So joining up people from your, across your organization and supporting sharing of information will help with the flow of knowledge. Um, communities of practice help us scale our ways of working and share common approaches across teams. When communities own quality and standards, it decentralizes assurance. So that removes the need for us to have somebody in the middle telling everyone what to do because we have consistent approaches across the communities. And some people codify this. So this is Atlassian and uh, talking about things like their brand, their marketing, their product, their common approaches to doing things that is owned and updated by the community. So this is actually, and, and they make that publicly available, but it's available to everyone across Atlassian. Added to this, communities are an amplifier. They help you make bigger changes than you can on your own. So it's very hard to change, change something if you're one person, particularly if you're in an organization with thousands of people. When you join up with other people, um, it helps you change. Uh, it gives you a bigger voice. Um, so sharing approaches and having responsibility for quality will help to scale ways of working across an organization. Um, and my fifth reason is communities of practice help us collaborate and create better practices for everyone. This is Alex Pentland. He uh, does has a lot of research into organizations that shows that organizations where people talk to each other are way more successful than organizations where people don't talk to each other. And he says that uh, communities can develop a collective intelligence in it that's greater than the members' individual intelligence. Now, this is because when we collaborate with each other, we can build on top of each other's ideas. When we work on our own, um, all, all we can do is build on top of our own ideas and all our experience comes from what we've experienced. When we're a group of people, we have tons of experience to draw from. Uh, so we, you know, together we can do amazing things. Um, and communities, you know, just being proud of collaboration between teams that have no interaction is really crucial. And I mentioned hierarchy earlier. Um, when we have flat structures, the idea that no one is more important than anyone else, um, we bring people together with lots of expertise. And when you have lots of expertise, maybe you have less experimentation. When you bring together people that have lots of experimentation, maybe less expertise, you get this real creativity that happens in the middle. So there's some really fantastic things that can happen there. So bringing people together from across the organization to share common challenges will lead to them collaborating to make awesome things. Um, I will share these slides earlier, so I won't read through these all these benefits again, but these are the five benefits. And I just wanted to um, give you a couple of examples of communities in action and some of the things that uh, they can achieve. So things that I've seen, so specialist training owned, updated and delivered by communities. So real kind of money saving as well, because you're not bringing external people, but uh, communities owning training and really helping to develop the capability of the organization. Things like um, guidance, living documents and reusable components. So here we have Google's design system. Um, on the right, we have the uh, UK government service manual that tells uh, government organizations how they can make successful services. And here the API page, which is owned by the technology community. So they update that um, fantastically useful uh, for lots of organizations. Things like capability plans. Um, this is a group of designers creating their capability plan for design across their organization, having a joined up approach to learning alongside their personal plans. Um, I mentioned uh, things like forums, so help and support through forums, physical and digital and synchronous and asynchronous. So we've got Slack channel here and also Stack Overflow, which is a huge uh, resource for developers or anyone that wants to talk about any kind of code uh, to get help and advice from from other developers. Peer to peer mentoring and specific support, which happens across communities. Um, when you have communities of practice, it's much easier to find uh, mentors and um, peer to peer mentoring. So organizations like Google, amongst many others, uh, are big on doing peer to peer mentoring. It's fantastic for raising people's capability and whole organizational transformation. So there's a bank in the UK that credit their agile transformation to the community of practice, as well as their strategy to transformation. So huge benefits to both individuals and the organization. Uh, so a couple of tips on getting started. If you uh, are thinking about getting started um, and, um, or you're already going, uh, it's, 
does take some time and effort. Communities go through a, a maturity um, phases as they grow from potential to forming. Um, the really the really crucial thing about this graph, which is when I when I first saw the the graph, I adapted it from um, really comforted me was just this energy invisibility just after forming. There's a dip in energy and visibility. And often you think, oh, no, the community is not working. It's failing. But this is a really normal thing to happen because when something's new, everyone is excited about it. Um, and then the, this this dip, dip happens. But if you keep going, keep working through it, you get to maturing where um, the value increases and eventually self-sustaining where um, the community is just part. Communities are just part of the organization. They're just expected. They're respected. Um, they're just there. Um, the, I have 10 quick steps for successful communities of practice, and this is this early step. So identify who wants to make it happen with you. Uh, have an idea who the community is for, who the members should be and what its purpose is. Get those members together really regularly because that regular meeting helps build uh, those support networks. Start by sharing stories. Stories are a really fantastic way of uh, connecting with each other. So stories about what you're doing, stories about your challenges. Then align around some common values and goals, grow organisational support, create opportunities for learning, building trust, adding value and supporting each other, um, extend your reach and what you do, and then see what works and turn up the good and, and keep going. So it does take, you know, some effort to get going um, and to build momentum, but just but keep going. Um, it is valuable. It's worthwhile. Um, so uh, finally, you know, it's moving from silos to sharing knowledge, to solving shared problems, to using the collective power of the community to create better practices. Um, I have a Venn diagram I like to use to describe this. So we have this beaver and this duck um, in their silos. <clears throat> Here they are sharing knowledge and starting to lead to sharing and reducing duplication. And then we have the magic in the middle. So something that's created that maybe we couldn't expect to happen um, is our communities of practice. Um, I totally uh, borrowed this uh, this illustration from Tenso Graphics. Um, finally, I have a book. It's called Building Successful Communities of Practice. Um, that I launched a couple of years ago. It's a very practical guide to doing some of these things. And thank you. And do we have time for questions? Is JD there? Yeah, hi, sorry, it takes me a while. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm just gonna... Yeah, we do have a couple of questions, so... Um, how yeah. much time do we have? Sorry, I'm lost. I think we have around just under 20 minutes, so I think we're... Yeah, so okay, cool. ...to add questions. Do you want me to read them out for you? Uh. No, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, go for it. Right. So the first one is uh, from Devang. How do you keep community of practices, communities of practices buzzing? I have seen number of uh, communities successful, while also seen others, while also seen the other side, and people start losing interest over a bit of time. So, what's your experience in, in that? Um, so I think it's very important to uh, also think about sense of community. So um, there's a number of things like we know we can feel sense of community because we have it in uh, in lots of different communities because we're, we're all members of different communities, both inside and outside work. And we know we know kind of when they're when they're working. And there's a number of things that help with that. Um, and so uh, having a safe environment is really important. So people feel uh, safe and supported. Um, having um, uh, one really important thing is about fulfillment of needs. So people need to feel rewarded in some way for taking part. So if they don't feel that they're getting something out of it, they will duck out of it. And actually, you can also think about that in terms of uh, priority. So sometimes people will say, oh, I don't have time to go. But it, what they tend to mean is that this thing isn't as important as something else. Um, and there might be a number of reasons for that. It might be that the work pressure is too much, in which case there's uh, an organisational cultural challenge there, or it might be that they're not they're not taking part because they don't see what's in it for them. So it's important for them to see what's in it for them and for them to get that value out of it. 
Um, there's also things like uh, the I mentioned two things like the uh, safety and membership. So knowing the edges of the community can be very useful. Um, having uh, fulfillment of needs. There's also influence. So having influence over the community, people need to feel like they can help direct it and they have some ownership over it, but they also have a shared voice um, and um, those, yeah, those social, social connections and shared history are important. So I also think mixing up what you do. So when you meet up, you're not always doing the same thing. Sometimes you're dealing with challenges like, challenges inside your work your day-to-day -day, your job those kind of things and sometimes you're doing sessions where you're learning new things so sometimes you're looking in and sometimes you're looking out um and having kind of a uh, having a kind of runway of those things coming up can help keep people engaged but yeah okay great um, uh, here's sure. the hope next that, hopefully one. that answered <laughs> right yeah cool Okay, here's the next one. It's pretty interesting by Anirudh Verma. So he says, uh, I'm part of a community of practice and we do understand most of the advantages of it. But somewhere down the road, the importance of these communities fade out and we tend to have strict agendas and a lot of publicity uh, to keep it moving. So what happens is the focus changes from making the community successful rather than making it collaborative or as a collaborative forum. So the idea is to publish, publicize it and make it more successful and the aim gets somewhere lost down, down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's kind of uh, the, the, the challenge that most people have um, when communities aren't working is, is around uh, engagement. And there's two ways that you can you can go about this. Um, one is to go big and lots of publicity. The other way is to go small and let things um, and and build really strong foundations. Um, and that kind of grows organically uh, as as you add new things. There's, there's, there's two different ways. Um, I do think it's really important to be, I guess, quite clear about what your purpose is. So if you want to inspire people to engaged then being very clear about what is it that you're trying to achieve so what your purpose is what your vision what your north star is um and potentially what are uh, some of the goals that might sit under that um i do you know publicity and it and it depends on the nature of your organization so small you know in small organizations the word gets around very quickly in, in large organizations it might not I, doing things like um showing people the value that you have uh, the value that individuals have got from the communities as well as the value that the organization has got from communities. Um, it's kind of twofold. One, uh, the value from for the organization will help the organization support you. And it's also useful to have sponsors, um, senior sponsors to support you as well. And the value from individuals um, will, will help bring people to you. So doing things like uh, publicly, like doing show and tells or blog posts or showing people the, um, you know, again, telling stories about, about the value people have, uh, the, the value the communities of practice have created can really help with that. I don't know if that answered your question. Please, if, if not, um, feel free to put a follow-up question in. Yeah, do, do, do write, I mean, you can do follow-up in the chat as well if you want any more uh, elaboration or clarification. Uh, the next one is from Sridhar. Uh, is there a way to measure the effectiveness of community of practice sessions? How do we measure effectiveness? Um, so uh, you, there are a number of ways that you, you might want to measure the effectiveness of communities of practice in, in general. Um, on, on a session by session basis, it might simply be, um, so there's, there's one tactic, one, one technique I should say, uh, for when you're running a workshop, for example, that um, when people leave the room, you might put something. Uh, I know we don't have necessarily physical rooms at the moment, but finding a way to do this, uh, people might put um, a, a dot on a chart that says, was this worth my time? <laughs> um, and, and for a session that helps you understand whether the people coming to the session, whether it was worth their time coming along. So whether they got value out of 
out of the session itself with the community of practice as a whole there's a there's a number of things there's a number of potential options here so one is that um i do like to look at those five benefits um and actually i've got uh i'll uh, share it in the chat um i've got a, a tool that i released recently um that's free uh let me find it um which helps you look at it helps you kind of is a quick review on how you're doing. Um, oh, that's not in the right place. Um, how how you're doing as a community of practice. I'll just share that there, um, which just gives you a quick sense check uh, against those five benefits. Like, are we a support network? Are we learning? Are we et cetera, et cetera. The other way to look at it um, from the other side is the impact that the community is having on the organization. And be really careful with this stuff, because what you don't want to do is throw people into a community of practice and say, you should be creating impact for the organization right now, because I do really believe that creating that support network and those strong foundations are probably the most important thing to do. Um, and then after that, uh, seeing, um, su supporting the communities through, through kind of creating wider impact on the organization. Um, so yeah, those those are the two things that I would look at when looking at the effectiveness of communities of practice in general. Right. Okay. Uh, Hopefully this, that answers I'm, your questions, Rida. Yeah. Okay. As another one by Anirudh says, like in your experience, which communities work better, structured or unstructured, or a blend of both? Um, I think that I think communities need a little bit of both, <laughs> um, although it depends. And, and I've also seen there's there's real value in bringing people together through communities that aren't necessarily work related. So uh, one organization I was working with had a flower arranging club. And the real value in that was that they were people that got together regularly and they that meant that they knew each other which meant that they can work together more effectively in the future because they, they've already, they're they already friends with each other. Um, so uh, that kind of community, like getting people together that love food and want to talk about that or love films and want to talk about that is, is also, uh, and those are probably more unstructured, is, is really valuable. Having a little bit of structure, and I think it's, it's like anything that we do, it's like, you know, it's like when we're learning how to do Agile, for example, having some patterns to follow can really uh, help us get started. So, and we get to the point where maybe we break out of those patterns and, and try things out for ourselves. Um, so I guess a blend of both. Um, okay. I think we've, we've got a few uh, questions in the, in the audience in chat, the chat yeah. as well. Um, yeah. Actually, what happens is the question which gets posted so in the Q&A in chat as well. Okay, yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, um, there's, there's a question here about um, a virtual community of practice. Um, and I just wanted to, to pick up on that quickly because I think that's that's super relevant to like to, to all of us right now um, is that everyone is, is working uh, remotely from each other. Um, or working away from each other. So in, in, in some terms, we are uh, virtual. Um, I think a lot of things are very similar. I, I, I've been uh, doing some writing recently about the idea of serendipity um, in organisations, which is something that we're really missing uh, at the moment, whilst people aren't bumping into each other in corridors or aren't uh, bumping into each other in canteens or having lunch together, whatever that might be. Um, I think there's a need in 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 any organisation and communities as well to find other ways for people to have to get to know each other. I don't think that's true in communities in general. That it's not it's not just about the meeting. There's other things as well. So um, I run a uh, the the meetup that I run that's um, online. Um, I have a which is called Agile Ether. It's open to anyone anywhere. Um, I. That has that's now become a community um, as well. We have a Slack channel with a bunch of people that have never physically met before because they live in different countries. Um, but we support the meetups that we have with other things. So 
a, I'm a massive fan of a concept called um, random coffee. <laughs> um, we have remote random coffee where people are randomly paired with somebody um, for half an hour just to have a chat. Um, and it might be somebody that they've not met before. I think this is a fantastic thing to do across communities as well, is that you you bringing people closer together and getting them to know each other through these um, conversations that are not focused on a specific outcome. And having the chance to do that, I think, is is really fantastic. And I would I would encourage that, particularly uh, during lockdown, if you can. It doesn't have to be over video. <laughs> it can be over the phone. Um, yeah, I think I think that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any any? We have just under five minutes in here. Yeah, and there are a, there are a few uh, in the in the audience chat. I'll just read one out. Um, any mm -hmm. quick tips for forming a community involving global teams from different cultural backgrounds? Maybe that random coffee thing might work. Yes. So um, <laughs> random coffee. Do you know I, I uh, and I've. I've uh, worked um, in a few locations, a few different cultures, both organizational cultures um, and different countries. Uh, essentially, essentially, it comes back to the fact that there's a lot that with with although we might be different in some ways, we're the same. Everyone's the same in many ways, um, like, you know, needing to connect with each other. Um, I, I think it's important for uh, anyone to uh, try and get to understand each other and and uh, build empathy and so i would always say with any any community anyway and particularly if uh, people are from different cultures to to build understanding and build empathy so that you can uh, work together more effectively so finding ways to do that uh, i think is important right okay we probably can squeeze Hopefully. another one, two, three minutes to go. Yeah, how, yeah, this might not, it might, this might take longer than two minutes, maybe, but the question is uh, from Pawan, how do we bring an alignment within a community when it has started so that everyone understands the intent and participates in it? Not an easy answer, but. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick, a quick tip. <laughs> Um, I think it's I think it's really important to well first of all I do think it's important to have a purpose that people agree with so I think I think that can help I also think it's useful to have uh, some shared principles um, and being explicit about those principles so there's a workshop that I like to run whenever creating principles which is called the anti problem and this is kind of fun workshop as well lots of post-it notes I'm always using post-it notes but you get everybody to talk about what's the worst possible something so you say what's the worst possible community um and it becomes a bit of a therapy session there's lots of <laughs> lots of painful things come out um and uh what you can do is take the things that come out of there and say okay these are all the things we don't want this community to be um so often there's things like people talking over each other people not listening to each other you know people not taking part those things um, and turn those around so you've got all like you've brought out all the worst things and you turn those around and say if we're not those if we're not that what is it that we're going to be and that helps you uh, create a set of shared principles uh, which talks about how you're how you're going to commit to the community what the principles of the community are and help to build some alignment between people that's my quick tip right i think yeah okay probably almost at the end of our time uh, thanks a lot, Emily, for doing this session for us. I think it was, went very well, very interactive, and I'm sure a lot of people got to participate. I think everyone learned quite a few things here, so great session overall. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, guys, for joining in and interacting with us. So thank you, and hopefully see you in the VIP booth in a bit.